Dear friends, today we live in a land of shadows. Stark shadows cast by what is worst in us and what is best. In 1945, as one of the worst convulsions of violence in the history of mankind drew to a close, the United Nations was born and its charter signed by 26 nations. This was a ray of light in a world still shrouded in darkness. Truly, the best of mankind was on display in the UN Charter, which affirmed the faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and the worth of the human person, and in equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was another milestone in the evolution of man's global consciousness, emerging as it did in 1948 in the aftermath of World War. In 1998, the government of the People's Republic of China publicly proclaimed its commitment to the principles of the Universal Declaration. But we must ask today how it is that the UN Charter, which speaks so eloquently to the aspirations of men and women around the world to live peacefully and secure lives is so readily ignored by some of its signatory states. We must ask how the declaration which states that everyone has a right to life, liberty, the security of person, that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, and that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. It's so casually traduced by one of the most powerful nations in the world. Truly, my dear friends, what is best in us what is most hopeful about us? What keeps our joint future as a species such a promise is so beautifully articulated in the Charter and the Declaration. These are principles by which we should organize ourselves as a human family. These are principles at the core of any meaningful democracy. And yet, many of our eyes have adjusted to the shadows that power and greed have cast on the existence of our brothers and sisters around the world. Whereas, the brief and visionary people who created the United Nations could see a world beyond the catastrophe they had just endured. We live in an age where what has been gained in principle, what has been recognized in fact, has been eroded by an acceptance that it is better to accommodate evil and hope it changes on itself than to seek to change it through pressure, denouncement, and direct confrontation. What else explains the presence of China on the United Nations Human Rights Council, a body supposedly responsible for strengthening the promotion and protection of human rights around the world? Back in March, I had a chance to address the Human Rights Council in the capacity of Chinese citizen. 
This was just after Libya was suspended for its outrageous abuses against its own people. While in front of that body, I recalled the case of Liu Xiaobo, among many others. I asked how China's communist regime, whose victims ran into hundreds of millions, could remain a member while Libya was expelled for its abuses. Where were you, I asked the representatives of member nations, when there was only an empty chair at the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo? Where were you, I asked, when police and hired thugs brutally beat Chen Guangcheng, a blind human rights defender whose house has been surrounded all day, every day since his release from prison in September of 2010. When, I asked, will you demand accountability from the individuals responsible for the Tiananmen massacre and for the gross and systematic violation of human rights in China? And so on and so forth. To be sure, there were many, many more questions that I didn't get enough time to ask. Unfortunately, I received no answers. More unfortunate than this, China still remains a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Dear friends, it says a lot about the importance of our work that an institution created to represent the best of what we can be retreat from a conflict with the worst. It says a lot about the work it must be done that the discussion we are having here today must take place outside the United Nations instead of inside its house and must take place among NGOs instead of among governments. Clearly, we have a great deal to do. And so, we have gathered here today in the shadow valley of our times to summon the wisdom and the best heritage of mankind and remind the entire world once again, each one of us has an opportunity to act in the way worthy of the best of our humanity. The other option is to adjust our eyes to the shadows. But my dear friends, I have seen firsthand what takes place in these shadows. In 1989, I was in Tiananmen Square. I saw my countrymen crushed beneath tanks and felled by machine gun fire. Even today, we don't know the names of all the victims of the Tiananmen Massacre. The noble souls of Chinese people who died in the crackdown do not rest in peace. Not because so many are unknown, but because the goals of their sacrifice are still suppressed by the Chinese regime. <laughs> the events of June 4th, 1989 were not a one-time event. In the 22 years since the massacre, China has never stopped violating human rights of its citizens. It has never lacked for prisoners of conscience in its jails. No country that behaves this way toward its citizen should have a place on the United Nations Human Rights Council. No country. <laughs> so today, we must demand that the United Nations 
readjust its eyes to the light and remove China from its Human Rights Council. China's membership will expire next May, and it needs 97 votes to get remained. If each and every democracy says no, then China shall stand no chance. This is truly a test of the sincerity and commitment of every democracy to democracy. Yes, China, with its territorial expanse and the larger population, economic power, military power, is a powerful member, very powerful member of the United Nations. But the UN should not apply different human rights standards to different member countries. The UN stands for fundamental values and principles. It must say no to the Chinese government on human rights violations. It must show the victims of the human rights violation in China and the rest of the world that justice and fairness are valued in this world after all. It must not capitulate to expedience. For what does, what does it say to Tianmen mothers, to Liu Xiaobo and his wife Liu Xia, to Gao Zhisheng, Wang Bingzhang, Liu Xianbing, Chen Guangcheng, Chen Wei, Ding Mao, Hada, to Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, to house church members, to Falun Gong practitioners, to victims of forced abortions, forced evictions, forced disappearances, and black jails, if China remains a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council. What does it say to our brief brothers and sisters in the Arab world, our dear friends in Burma, and the victims of dictators in the sub-Saharan Africa, if, if China continues to cynically sit on the body suppose, supposedly committed to expanding the reach of the rights guaranteed by both the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. No, the behavior of China towards its own people and internationally cannot condone. Those people in the middle of the last century who created the United Nations rose to the challenge of their times in the midst of the worst the world had ever seen. Surely we today, with their work as our foundation, can rise to the challenge of our own times. Surely we can. We can all see the shadows for what they are and say it is time to live, it's time to begin living in the light. Thank you. Thank you very much.